Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Louisa Baldwin. Sir Nigel Otterburn's Case It is thirty years since I completed my career at the Eastminster Hospital. I had passed all my examinations successfully and taken more than my share of medical honors when one of our most celebrated physicians, Dr. Grindrod, asked me to watch an important case for him, the study of which I should find of the deepest professional interest. Dr. Grindrod's patient was suffering from an obscure form of malaria, contracted abroad, which had developed into an extremely rare form of intermittent fever with really beautiful complications, such as he had never met with before in all his wide practice. But Sir Nigel Otterburn lived a three hours journey from town in Hampshire, and when the doctor went to see him, it took practically the whole day of his valuable time, which was more than he could afford to devote to any one case. Dr. Grindrod therefore proposed that he should see the patient himself once a week and send down one of the most promising of the hospital students to watch the case under him and to take minute medical notes of its progress. I was the fortunate man selected for the work and was to go into the country with Dr. Grinrod, taking with us a couple of our most trustworthy nurses. I can never again feel as important as I did on that first day of August when I entered upon my onerous duty. The doctor and I were met at the station and driven through lovely country to the Hamel, which was the name of Sir Nigel Otterburn's house. It was a fine specimen of Jacobian architecture and, externally at least, had undergone but little change for a couple of centuries past. It was a three-storied building with tall fluted chimneys and dormer windows in its high-pitched roof. The front of the house was nine windows wide narrow sash windows with a great deal of framework in proportion to the glass. The front of the house, with its wings left and right, made three sides of a quadrangle, the fourth side of which was formed by wrought iron railings with great gates in the center. Leaving the carriage outside for fear of disturbing the patient by the sound of our arrival, we crossed the wide courtyard on foot. The front door was approached by shallow steps and sheltered by a richly carved penthouse of black oak. Upon the wall between the second and third stories was a sundial, and the bright August sunshine threw the sharply defined shadow of the gilded gnomon on the figure denoting the hour of four o'clock in the afternoon. Above the dial a small turret rose from the center of the roof, surmounted by an elaborate piece of ironwork with quaintly twisted letters N, S, E, and W, and a glittering arrow for a weather vane. I was struck by the appearance of the house, at once stately and homely but I received from it an impression of melancholy which was not lessened when the door was opened by a gray-headed servant who led us across the paneled hall into a vast and dreary dining room. It contained nothing in the way of furniture except a long table with a row of high-backed chairs pushed close against it on either side and a sideboard of carved oak on which stood a row of silver flagons. A china bowl on the middle of the table, filled with roses and white lilies, made the atmosphere of the room heavy with their perfume. A few gloomy old portraits looked down from their tarnished frames, some with faces austere and rigid as though they had been painted after death. Dr. Grindrod had acquainted me with the details of Sir Nigel Otterburn's case on our journey, and having nothing further to say till we had seen the patient, he stood with his hands behind his back, looking at the portrait of a lady over the mantelpiece, so lavish in her charms that I assigned her at a glance to Charles II's period. "'That is what I call a magnificent woman,' said the doctor." waving his hands sumptuously toward the expanse of bare neck and bosom depicted on the canvas. But I should rather have applied the words to the lady who entered the room while he was speaking, and whom he introduced to me as Miss Otterburn. The doctor had told me that Sir Nigel Otterburn was a widower with an only daughter, but he had said nothing to prepare me for the appearance of so amazingly handsome a creature. I have never met a woman who so completely fascinated and interested me at first sight. Miss Otterburn was not a girl. She was in the ripe beauty of womanhood, and with a most dignified and haughty carriage. She covered me with a glance of her beautiful dark eyes, and curtsied so low that it was almost a sarcasm to a young man like myself. She was tall and slender, of an ivory pallor of complexion, with fine, sensitive features, and a mass of dark hair worn high on her head. She was dressed in some soft, cream-colored fabric, and her sleeves came only to the elbow, displaying to the utmost advantage her beautifully formed hands and arms. I promised you, Miss Otterburn, that I would bring one of our hospital students to watch Sir Nigel's case for me, said Dr. Grindrod. You must not mistrust Mr. Caxton because he is young. He has had experience in the hospital which many older men may envy, 
He will post to me daily notes of the patient's condition. I shall be down myself once a week, and you would telegraph me in any emergency. Indeed, my dear young lady, I can assure you that Sir Nigel is in good hands. And Dr. Grindrod smiled and attempted a light and easy manner. But Miss Otterburn was entirely irresponsive. Heaven grant that you may be right, she said in chilling tones, and she led us upstairs to the patient's room. As she walked erect before us, there was that in her bearing and appearance which reminded me of some distinguished Frenchwoman at the time of the Revolution, and I thought how many a proud head like hers had fallen from its white shoulders under the guillotine. Sir Nigel's room was dark and dreary, and he lay in a funereal bed with heavy hangings, and I mentally vowed to have him out of it, and in a more cheerful room within four and twenty hours. If the house did not contain some light, undraped bedstead, I would send to the hospital for one such as we use for our patients. Sir Nigel Otterburn was in a half-comatose state when I first saw him, and I judged him to be about sixty-two or three years of age. He was tall and thin, and looking at his face, I saw at a glance whence Miss Otterburn derived her fine features. His hair and mustache were thick and gray, and he looked what he was, a soldier. In his lucid intervals there was a dignity of self-restraint in his manner, which again reminded me of his daughter. The local practitioner, Mr. Walton, was present in the room, a good-humored, rustic-looking man, more like a farmer than a doctor, but who, if he was unprofessional in appearance, luckily for me had less than the usual amount of professional jealousy. So far from being annoyed at seeing me installed in the house to watch the case of his distinguished patient for Dr. Grindrod, he expressed his approval of an arrangement that relieved him of so much responsibility. But he said nothing before Miss Otterburn, and I saw that she exercised the same repressive influence over him that I felt so strongly myself. But when we were in the dining room again, and I received my final instructions from Dr. Grindrod, Mr. Walton said, as he poured himself out a glass of sherry, I don't profess that single-handed I could pull Sir Nigel round. I've not had the opportunity of studying malarious fevers, but if you gentlemen succeed in curing the patient, I share the glory of it, and if he slips through your fingers, Miss Otterburn cannot reproach me, for nothing could be expected of me where Dr. Grinrod failed. Is Miss Otterburn likely to reproach you if the case ends fatally? I asked. Mr. Walton looked round to see if the door was shut, emptied another glass of wine before he spoke, and said in a low voice, Miss Otterburn is Miss Otterburn, and it would be unprofessional to gossip about any member of my patient's family. Eyes and ears open, and mouth shut at the hamel, is my advice. After Dr. Grindrod's departure, I went upstairs to make arrangements for my first night in charge of Sir Nigel. A small room leading out of the patients had been assigned to my use, and I went to the window to look at the view. My eyes never rested on a more peaceful scene. Immediately in front of the house, bounded on either side by its projecting wings, was the great courtyard, with its wide grass borders bathed in sunshine, and beyond the iron palisades and the high gates, stretched an expanse of undulating country thickly wooded with trees in their heaviest summer foliage. On the brow of a gentle ascent, some quarter of a mile distant, stood a gray church with an ivy-grown tower, and the evening sunshine was glittering on the weather vane. When I had seen the night nurse enter upon her duties, I went for a stroll in the open air, leaving the house by a door at the back of the hall. I found myself in an old-fashioned garden with grass terraces and clipped yew hedges. I thought that I was alone in the garden, when suddenly I caught sight of Miss Otterburn's light dress, white and ghostly in the gathering gloom, and in a moment we were face to face on the path. I raised my hat and stood aside for her to pass, and I felt the blood mount to my cheeks. She might think I was intruding on her privacy, and following her on her evening walk. Miss Otterburn did not quicken her pace as she passed me. She regarded me with grave intensity, but her eyes were void of speculation, like one of those who was walking in her sleep. I watched her stately figure recede among the darkening alleys, and heard the door close as she entered the house. I felt chilled and disconcerted, why I could not tell, but I would run no second risk of appearing to intrude upon Miss Otterburn. At eleven o'clock Miss Otterburn entered her father's room to bid him good night. He scarcely knew her, yet I fancied that he smiled faintly as she pressed his hand, or it may have been the flickering of the lamplight on his face that I mistook for a smile. I trust Sir Nigel will have a tranquil night, I said. His nights are always tranquil, she replied in measured tones, and yet he has gained no strength the five weeks he has lain here. 
He never will, she said in the same passionless voice. You speak more positively, Miss Otterburn, than any doctor would dare to do. Such an illness as Sir Nigel's is not necessarily fatal. We do not know. But I know, and her voice sank to a whisper. It is useless your staying here. My father will never leave this house alive. It is wrong to speak so, I said firmly, and if Sir Nigel understands what you say, it must cause him the most exquisite pain. Not a line in her white handsome face softened or changed. My father knows it already, she said, and swept from the room, leaving me bewildered by her manner. I slept but little during my first night at the Hamel. My mind was so much occupied with Sir Nigel's case that I went frequently to see my patient and to note any change in his condition, however slight. My obstinacy, too, was roused by Miss Otterburn's assertion that her father would die by the way in which she ignored anything that medical skill could do for him. Her manner was that of a person expressing a profoundly melancholy conclusion forced upon her against her will, and yet that she believed to be irrevocably true. If that man's sentence has not gone forth from heaven, he shall live, I exclaimed, and that handsome, obstinate creature shall be taught that she is not infallible. My resolution being made, I tried to sleep, but tried in vain. The profound silence of the country after the roar of London had the same effect upon me that noise has upon those who are accustomed to quiet, and kept me wide awake. And from time to time I was startled by the screeching of owls, sounding like the cries of terrified children lost in the dark. At length the dawn came, and I rose to go into Sir Nigel's room. This time he was conscious, and as I felt his pulse he whispered, Are they come? Yes, I replied, supposing that he alluded to me and the nurses. We came yesterday, and we shall try to relieve you as much as we can. But he sighed impatiently, closed his eyes, and turned his head from me. It was useless to lie down, so I dressed myself, and the clock was striking four as I opened the window and leaned out to enjoy the freshness of the morning air. To my great surprise, Miss Otterburn was also looking out of her window in the center of the right wing of the house. I drew back at once, but she had not heard me throw up the sash, and she was not looking in my direction. Her dark eyes were fixed in a trance-like gaze on the entrance to the courtyard or on the church crowning the grassy slope. She certainly was not looking at any part of the house. She was ghastly pale, and her eyes wore the same unseeing expression that I had noticed in them from the previous evening. For more than a quarter of an hour, Miss Otterburn remained immovable, and how long she may have been at her casement before I saw her I cannot tell. She was wrapped in a white robe, and her dark hair lay in waves on her shoulders, but her face was not like that of a living woman. It seemed probable that I might have two patients in the house to look after, and I felt a distinct sense of relief when at length she withdrew from the window and I lost sight of her. That day I carried out my intention with regard to Sir Nigel, we moved him into a small bed and carried him to a bright, cheerful sitting-room on the same floor, a room suggesting pleasant, sunny life as clearly as the gloomy bedroom had suggested death. I felt sure that the patient would appreciate the change, that it would prove beneficial to him, but to my disappointment he did not appear to notice it and it produced no effect on his physical condition. I heard him murmuring to himself as he lay, it will make no difference. It was singular, too that Miss Otterburn seemed to take no interest in her father's removal to a more cheerful quarters. However, I had Dr. Grindrod's approval of what I had done, and I was content. "'How do you get on with Miss Otterburn?' the doctor asked me abruptly on one of his visits, when I had been more than a week in the house. "'You might as well ask me how I get on with that picture on the wall,' I replied. "'But I think she is the handsomest woman I ever saw in my life.' "'You do, do you? Hum, not my style. I prefer flesh and blood.' and Dr. Grindrod shot a glance in the direction of the Charles II lady and fell to talking of purely medical matters. When I had been in hourly attendance on Sir Nigel for a fortnight, I began to realize not only that my patient was making no progress, but that I was making no progress with my patient. I expected no lively gratitude from him, but it would have been pleasant if there had been any token of recognition, either on his part or his daughter's, that I was doing my utmost for him. I imagined that he regarded me as a servant whose attentions were indispensable to his comfort, but with whom he could not be familiar. It did not annoy me, sometimes it even amused me, for I never count a sick man in the category of sane persons, and so no more think myself insulted by an invalid than by a madman. This excuse, however, 
did not apply to Miss Otterburn, and I was puzzled more and more by her conduct. Every morning at earliest dawn, if I looked out, she was leaning on her window sill, gazing with tragic melancholy, not, I am sure, at any tangible object, but on something that presented itself to her mental vision. Not only did I gain no ground with Sir Nigel and his daughter, but the old housekeeper and butler, though perfectly civil to me, were both exceedingly reserved. Sometimes the housekeeper would have a short confab with me on her master's state, consisting on her part, consisting on her part chiefly of sighs and head shakings, and once the butler went so far as to observe, Master Raymond will wish that he'd parted friends with his father when he went to India. So then Sir Nigel had a son, a fact of which I was not aware, and furthermore it would seem that father and son had had some quarrel or misunderstanding. Meanwhile, there was no disguising the unwelcome fact that my patient was steadily sinking. Dr. Grindrod approved of all that I did in carrying out his instructions to the letter, but nothing we could do availed to check the downward course, and we racked our brains for treatment and remedies which should keep the enemy at bay. The disease was not running a normal course. Unexpected complications arose at an unusual period in its progress, and how interesting the battle between the force of disease and the power of science became to me none but an enthusiast in the medical profession can tell. I seldom quitted the patient's room. Only when he was sleeping did I venture to leave him for an hour in charge of a nurse while I went for a stroll in the fresh air. It was just before sunset one evening, when I had been nearly a month at the Hamel, that I closed the front door gently behind me and, crossing the courtyard, let myself out into the park and made my way towards the church on the grassy slope. I was exhausted and excited, and I walked bareheaded that the cool breeze might blow about my heated temples. I hated to be baffled. I had been so sure of victory, and now defeat stared me in the face. Miss Otterburn would have a melancholy triumph. She would be right after all, and I would be wrong. I went over every event of the previous weeks in detail. I was satisfied that all that medical science could do for Sir Nigel, at the point to which it had then attained, had been done and was still being done for him but I reflected with a crushing sense of impotence on the irresistible power of the force with which I was contending. I, a finite being, was measuring my strength against death, the conqueror of man. The contest was hideously unequal. I was sure to be worsted. Even if the patient recovered, it would be at best but a reprieve, and sooner or later he must, reach, he must retrace his anguished steps toward that bourne from whence I was striving with all my strength to turn him back. I entered the churchyard in the deepest depression of spirit. It was not merely the anticipated loss of my patient that weighed upon me. That was but one item in the incalculable total of human misery. In his death I saw the doom of every son of Adam, the death of the whole human race. I was ready to wish that I had died myself, which constantly brought me face to face with a terrible elementary fact in nature, with which the utmost skill of man is powerless to cope. The church door stood hospitably open, and I entered the cool twilight within. Here were the tombs of the Otterburns, from the time when intramural burial was a universal custom to the present period, when a memorial tablet or monument is all that is permitted within the church itself. I thought how soon Sir Nigel would be numbered among his ancestors, and be as remote from us who still lived, as his own earliest forebears were from him now. Suddenly I heard a deep sigh, and starting, I turned and saw Miss Otterburn close to me but almost hidden by a great pillar against which she leaned. Her dark eyes were fixed with the wide, unseeing gaze which I had noticed in them each early morning as she looked from her window. I spoke to her, and when she heard my voice, the pupils of her eyes dilated as though the twilight had deepened around her. Miss Otterburn, if there is anything that you wish to say to Sir Nigel, I would advise you to take the opportunity of his next interval of consciousness. It grieves me to be obliged to say this, but I have no choice in the matter. I must tell you the truth. Yes, they will soon come. I know it, she said with a slight shudder. I thought that she was wandering in her mind, and, taking no notice of her incoherent reply, I continued, I would give my life, Miss Otterburn, if I could prolong the life of one so dear to you. But she looked past and through me, as though she were piercing into futurity, and I heard her say, When they come, you will know that I was right. And she glided like a ghost out of the dim church, into the amber light of the evening. Her manner disquieted me profoundly, and I wished that Miss Otterburn was not so lonely, that her brother in India was at home to take his share of the trouble and to comfort his sister. 
I hastened back to my patient's bedside, and, knowing that it would be impossible to leave him that night, I sat down to copy my notes of the case for my own private use. About eleven o'clock, Sir Nigel rallied slightly, and I administered a powerful restorative and sent the nurse to fetch Miss Otterburn at once. As she entered the room, I said, If you would like to be alone with your father, I will remain within call outside the door. She bowed her head in assent, and I left them together. I remained waiting in my own room, listening to Miss Otterburn's voice distinctly audible in low, urgent tones. Then, as Sir Nigel again lapsed into unconsciousness, she spoke a little louder, and I heard her say, Father, will you not forgive Raymond? And then all was silent. I re-entered the room, and Miss Otterburn was kneeling by her father's bedside. She had been weeping, and I saw that beneath the armor of pride and reserve there was a woman's tender heart. But my return was the signal for her to depart, and she left the room hastily, as though displeased that I had witnessed her emotion. I looked at my dying patient with more regret than I should have thought possible to feel for a man who, in his short intervals of consciousness, had always treated me as a stranger. Certainly I had no affection for Sir Nigel, but I was struck by the pathos of the situation. There he lay, needing, like each one of us, both divine and human forgiveness, but unable to ask it for himself or to grant it to another, even when it was his daughter who knelt weeping by his side, imploring pardon for her brother. Slowly the night passed, and slowly the patient died. I noted the decreasing temperature, the failing pulse, and I applied restoratives which formerly had power to rally him, though now they had lost their virtue. But the heart still beat, and now and then a sighing breath escaped his lips. There was nothing more that I could do, but that I might leave no expedient untried, I sent the nurse into my room for an air cushion, which I told her to inflate and bring to me. If I raised the patient's head by means of it, it was possible that he might feel a momentary ease, though he would be unconscious of its cause. I looked at my watch. It was four o'clock, and the gray light of dawn glimmered through the curtains. I wondered whether Miss Otterborn was at her window, according to her strange custom, when the door opened swiftly and silently, and she entered the room as I had often seen her at that hour, clad in a loose white robe, and her dark hair hanging about her shoulders. There was a mortal pallor on her face. She did not cast a glance in the direction of her dying father, but exclaiming in tones that chilled my blood, They have come! They have come! She went to the window, drew back the curtains, let in the cold light of dawn, and stood with clasped hands, gazing into the courtyard below. I was by her side in an instant. They have come! They have come! I knew they would come! and I heard the effort she made to speak with a tongue that was dry with terror. In the courtyard beneath, directly opposite to the window, was a strange, silent crowd of men, women, and children looking up at us in the faint morning light with faces of the dead. And though they pressed and thronged each other on the gravel path, not a sound was heard. I am not a superstitious man, and in those days my nerves were of iron, but I reeled as I stood, and the blood rushed to my head with a singing sound. I saw the dead of centuries ago, and the dead of yesterday. Gray-bearded men who fought in the civil wars, young men and maidens who were never contemporaries in this life, and little children, all gazing at us with upturned faces. Miss Otterburn spoke again, as one speaks in a nightmare, with deadly effort and oppression. I know them. I saw them when they came to fetch my grandfather, and when they fetched my mother. Oh, mother, mother, you are there and she leaned forward in an agony and gazed with set and rigid face at a slim form that drifted through the ghostly throng and lifted its sad eyes to hers. By her side stood a tall man in uniform, whose white face I shall never forget, and he solemnly waved his hand towards us. "'Oh, heaven! My brother Raymond is with him!' shrieked Miss Otterburn, and sank on the floor insensible at the moment that Sir Nigel gave his last groan. I hastily fetched a cushion and placed it under his head, and then turned once more to the window. But the courtyard was absolutely empty, nor was there a trace of its recent occupation. I could not have been absent from the window for a couple of minutes, and the instantaneous disappearance of the ghastly throng shook my nerves fully as much as the sight of it had done. There was not a mark on the untrodden dewy grass, not a pebble displaced on the broad gravel path that had been so crowded a moment before. On the spot where the tall figure had stood and waved its hand to us, a cat was seated, 
licking her paws, and I heard the fitful chirp of the first awakened birds. I felt physically ill, and turning from the window, I poured out and drank a powerful cordial that restored an artificial calmness to my nerves. Just then the nurse returned. She had not been absent from the room for more than five minutes. The patient is dead, and Miss Otterburn has fainted, I said. Help me to lay her on the couch. I have never in all my experience seen anyone in so deep a swoon. The nurse and I were unspeakably relieved when at length she showed signs of returning consciousness, though I dreaded what she might say when she recovered. I gave her a composing draught which would secure her some hour's rest and committed her to the care of her maid. I sent at once for the family doctor, who had seen Sir Nigel on the previous night, to acquaint him with the death of the patient. He was exceedingly inquisitive about every possible detail, and appeared to long for some information concerning something he dared not inquire about directly. Were there any circumstances of an unusual character attending the death? he asked anxiously. It was an ordinary termination of such an illness of Sir Nigel's, I replied guardedly. And Miss Otterburn? How did she bear the shock? She had a severe fainting fit, and remained insensible for fully half an hour. She appears to feel her loss acutely. Mr. Walton agreed with me that I had better remain in the house till the following day to make the necessary arrangements for the funeral, and to write to Miss Otterburn's relations, with whose names and addresses the butler supplied me, to prevent his mistress from being disturbed. The old man became almost talkative for so taciturn a person. The family has died and died, till yonder churchyard is full of them, he said. The very soil of it was once Otterburn flesh and blood, and there's no one left of this branch but Miss Otterburn and the Major in India that's now Sir Raymond. There's a few cousins up in the north, and a widowed sister of the master's, and they'll like to come for the funeral, if it's only to see where they'll be laid themselves when their time comes, for all the Otterburns are brought here to be buried. Will one of the ladies of the family stay with Miss Otterburn till her brother returns from India? I asked. And as it was the first question I had asked, the old man cast a suspicious glance at me, resumed his uncommunicative manner, and changed the subject of the conversation. By noon I had sent the nurses back to London. Then there remained the long afternoon and evening in which to collect my distracted thoughts and get my nerves into something like order for a return to the active duties of life. I could not for an instant forget the horror of that early dawn. I saw, as clearly as I now see the pen with which I am writing this narrative, the ghostly throng with upturned, dead faces gazing at us, and Miss Otterburn's words and cries still rang in my ears. Whatever the ghostly vision was, we had both of us seen it. If only one person had seen it, and that one myself, I should not have been convinced of its reality. I should have believed that I was subjected to some terrible hallucination. But we both saw it at the same moment, and Miss Otterburn had seen it twice before, and each time under the same ghastly circumstances. There was no doubt that it had been as visible to us as natural objects are. It was no picture conjured up separately in our brains. I confess that I was so unnerved, I could not look out of that window again, nor could I spend my last night at the Hamel in any room at the front of the house. I asked the housekeeper to give me a bed in one of the back rooms. She cast a peculiar glance at me and said, You don't care for the room that looks out into the courtyard, and I don't blame you for it, but you need not mind now, sir. They won't come again till, till they are sent. I made frequent inquiries during the day about Miss Otterburn, but I did not ask to see her, so fearful was I of the effect my presence might have in recalling the horror we had witnessed together. The last thing at night, I sent a message to her saying that I should return to town in the morning, and I hoped that she would send for me if I could be of the slightest service to her. But she did not require me, and I retired for the night to a small back room on the second floor. Sleep was out of the question. I did not undress, but sat smoking pipe after pipe and trying to read, till when the gray dawn came, a great terror took possession of me, and I shook like a man in a fit of ague. I scorned myself for my weakness, but the feeling was beyond my control. At length, when daylight flooded the room, I threw myself across the bed and fell into a deep sleep which must have lasted hours, and from which I was awakened by a loud knocking at the door. Who is there? I said, starting to my feet, and the knock was again repeated. I ran to the door and opened it. The old butler stood before me, pale and trembling. Miss Otterburn wishes to see you, sir, in her sitting room. Tell her I will be with her directly, 
and I hastened to make myself fit to enter the presence of a lady, and went downstairs to Miss Otterburn's room, where her maid stood waiting for me with a scared face. She said nothing, but opened the door of her mistress's room. I entered, and she closed it after me. Miss Otterburn was standing by the table with an open letter in her hand. I should not have known her. Her hair had turned white in the last twenty-four hours, and there was a strange glitter in her eye. She handed me the letter, saying, It was Raymond that we saw with them. I knew it. I read the letter. It was very short, a few lines written in haste by a friend of the Major's to Sir Nigel, telling him of the death of his son, of cholera Mirat a month before, and promising all particulars by the next mail. As my mind took in the meaning of it, I grew giddy. The room became suddenly dark to me, and I groped for a chair like a blind man. Miss Otterburn laughed, the cackling laugh of insanity, and it recalled me to myself in an instant through extremity of compassion for her. Why do you pretend to be surprised? You knew that Raymond was dead as well as I. We both saw him. Oh, he was merry. They were all a merry company. Why should we be sad? And the poor lady laughed in such an awful fashion, I could have shed tears of blood to listen to her. It was the last time that I saw Miss Otterburn. Twenty long years she continued to live at the Hamel in a state of hopeless insanity, dangerous neither to herself nor others, while she was allowed to remain there. But if any attempt was made to take her elsewhere, her frenzy became ungovernable. They would not know where to find me, she would say. They can only fetch me from here, and I want the merry, white-faced folk to come for me. And her anger would subside into dreadful laughter. Every day in the early dawn she rose to look out of her window into the courtyard, but one morning she failed to do so, and her attendant was thankful to find Miss Otterburn lying peacefully dead on the twentieth anniversary of her father's death. The End